I recently became interested in learning more about SAT solvers. And uh, one of the things that I found in, in trying to, to get some sort of resources was that it seems like a lot of the literature, a lot of the videos are really aimed towards either people that are um, in academia or research or coming up with the state of the art SAT solver implementations, uh, or they're for people that probably already know a good deal about SAT and SMT solvers. If you are just getting into it, it, it seems like it's pretty hard to find something that can really uh, get you started uh, and, and help you understand how to use them and why you might use them. Uh, and if you think that maybe they could be useful in your professional toolbox, um, getting to a point where you can actually apply them to, to some real world problem has been a bit of a challenge. And another wrinkle in this is that if you are to a point where, where a SAT solver may be useful, uh, it's probably not a problem that is particularly easy to solve anyway. Um, you know, if you have a problem that you could, you could fix, uh, you could solve in a few minutes with some quick code, um, a SAT solver isn't really going to get you anything. And so it seems like these problems are kind of self-selected. They, they're, they're pretty difficult. Um, there are a few cases where uh, a SAT solver, I think, can uh, can really be uh, fairly easy to, to approach uh, and uh, really exhibits the, the power of a SAT solver. Um, so what I wanted to do is walk through, uh, kind of from cold, uh, uh, an implementation of a, a Sudoku solver uh, in SAT uh, as a hopefully a good way to, to um, demonstrate how easy they are and, and what the benefit of a SAT solver is over a traditional algorithmic approach. Now, if you are looking at um, trying to solve Sudoku with a traditional algorithm, you might have hundreds of lines of Python code or whatever your language of choice is, and you have to keep track of state and you have to uh, do uh, recursion and uh, keep track of whether you have, have modified anything in the current stack frame um, you have to do backtracking, uh, and even if you do that, and if you do it well, and even if, you, even if your code is easy to understand, it can still be fairly inefficient. Um, writing uh, a really efficient algorithmic Sudoku solver um, can be rather tricky. And I think uh, that implementing this in SAT uh, will end up being really straightforward uh, and probably also very efficient. So with that, let's get started. So I went to Web Sudoku and pulled up a puzzle, uh, and uh, this is going to be the basis for um, for actually trying to run the SAT solver. But what we're going to do first is set up all of the uh, constraints that we will uh, will need to apply to a general Sudoku puzzle uh, first. So I'm going to be using Z3, which is it seems like it's kind of the, the leader of the pack in SAT solvers. Uh, Z3 is, uh, is created by Microsoft Research, uh, and there is an official uh, Z3 library in Python. And we can just import all of the symbols from that and use that. Uh, and the, the first thing that we'll do is we'll create a solver. And this object is what we will be applying constraints to. And then when we're all done with the constraints, we can have it check for a satisfiable solution. So we can just check here, and we know that there should be a solution to uh, the Sudoku problem, so we can just check it. And this will actually generate a model internally, which we can then get. So when we're done, we can get the model, which is to say the set of values that satisfy all the constraints that we are looking for. Uh, and then initially what we can do is just print out um, the, the satisfying model. So this kind of bookends everything that we're doing. The first thing that we'll want to do now is create all of the variables or the, the constants that will go into uh, our, our project. So we need an, uh, an 81 uh, element grid uh, to represent our Sudoku. And then we can use this, this uh, int class that, uh, that is provided by Z3. And this represents uh, any integer, uh, not a machine integer of 32 bits, but any integer value. Um, that, that we want to represent. And we need to give it a name. And the name here doesn't really matter, but we'll make sure that each value is distinct. So 
So now this should represent all of the, the values that we need. We have a, a list of lists. Uh, and then the next thing to do is to go and apply the various constraints. And the first constraint that, that would make sense is every value has to be between 1 and 9 inclusive. So each value here uh, in this Python array uh, is going to represent an integer value uh, that is tied back to Z3. And what we can do is add to our solver the constraint that each one of these has to be greater than or equal to 1. And it has to be less than or equal to 9. Now we can add it like this, add multiple constraints, uh, or alternately what we could do is add them in like this. Uh, either way, it's the exact same. Uh, what's happening is that these constraints are being added to uh, to our solver, uh, and then Z3 will uh, will normalize all of our constraints into what's called conjunctive normal form. So this is the exact same. It doesn't really matter. As we're iterating over uh, each of these rows, we can add in the additional constraint that every uh, row has to contain distinct values from one to nine. And we can do the same thing for the columns as well. Now to do the, the three by three subgrids, there's probably some really clever way that we could do this in a very concise Pythonic uh, idiom. I think it's probably going to be just easier, uh, certainly quicker, to just come up with a way where we say we're going to iterate over the, uh, the three columns of grids and the three rows. So if we do something like this, then what we can do is add in the distinct uh, set of all the values within this subgrid. And what we'll do is wanna, we'll first get the top left value in any one grid. And then we're gonna need eight more values here. So now we have the nine values, but we have to update the x. So the first three will be for the top row, and then this is going to be for the second row, and then we need to make sure that each one starts in the leftmost value in its row, and then we'll have to move over one or two values. Okay, so I think this should satisfy all the constraints that we need for the general case of a pseudocode puzzle. Now, what we can do is we can try running this, and it's probably going to take a little while to run, because while we have all the constraints of what satisfies a logical Sudoku puzzle, we haven't actually applied any of these values here. We haven't told uh, the solver that the first value has to be 4. Um, and had we done that, we would have reduced the search space uh, of the, of the uh, puzzle. Uh, and for every one of these values that we add in, it will further constrain um, the, the puzzle. So it took 25 seconds for this to run. Um, and what this has effectively done is it's generated a solution to the, the Sudoku puzzle for a blank puzzle. What we can do, though, is, is add in some representation of this puzzle. Uh, now, what I did before I started is I got a, a representation of this puzzle where when we have a number, it's represented here. And when there's an open space, it's just represented by a period. So what we can do 
is uh, turn this into something that we can uh, just iterate over. And then, uh, then what we can do is, uh, as we iterate through each of these values, we can add a constraint if it applies. So this should be all that we need to specify all of the constraints that we know about this specific puzzle. Rather than printing it out, uh, printing out the full model, what we can do is add in uh, a little bit cleaner output of this. So we'll print out full rows here. And what we can do is index into uh, our grid. And we can use the model's eval function to evaluate for a given concrete uh, solution to the problem. Uh, we can take that concrete solution and then ask the, the model, what is the concrete value for this specific, um, this specific variable? Now this is going to be an integer, and so we'll want to convert this to a string. Uh, and this should give us our grid. And then just for um, a little bit of uh, cleanliness, we'll print out uh, a separator row. So this should do it now, and if we run this, we now have a solution. And what we can do is we can try uh, plugging in all these different values and we can see what happens. Okay, with all this entered, we should hopefully have a valid puzzle. Okay, so this works just fine. Now, I also opened up this other puzzle, uh, which is, it's a more difficult, um, it's a more difficult puzzle. It has, uh, fewer values uh, and uh, we, we would normally have a much more difficult time going through this manually. But if we go in here and we update our, our puzzle, okay, so now we have a solution that we can start entering. Okay, so we can see that this puzzle, uh, really all it took was uh, the, the time for us to enter in all the values uh, into the, uh, the solver and then back into the puzzle here. And uh, the time it took us is uh, really fast compared to what, what people are actually doing when they solve this um, you know, by hand. So uh, that is uh, kind of an end-to-end -end example of how, uh, how we can solve Sudoku. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is when we look at um, when we look at, at the uh, actual implementation here, this was 60 lines of, of Python code. Um, maybe not the most concise uh, given the, the 3x3 grid and then also the representation here. Um, but nothing in here requires that we try to figure out how to solve the problem. We are simply constraining what is a valid solution. And then um, Z3 is able to go through and, and solve this problem in uh, about two-thirds of a second. So hopefully that has been uh, useful and is maybe a reasonable uh, introduction to uh, the, the power of SAT solvers.